Welcome again to um, the second session of Pererin Oiv is Oilithriach May. I am a pilgrim, um, a cross border participatory arts project uh, seeking to collect with the um, Irish and Welsh uh, diaspora of North Pembrokeshire and North Wexford. Um, so uh, the project um, started on the 29th of September with an introductory session um, where uh, we, we talked about what the aims of the project are. Venuwe Eddie Rowan, East Misha Rowan Ninail. My name is Rowan O'Neill and I'm working with um, colleagues Jacob Whitaker and Alan Wills and Span Arts in Pembrokeshire. Um, and uh, we're working with colleagues in Wexford Rachel Whelan and um, John O'Whelan, um, uh, who, are, who are all here tonight. Um, the project uh, is responding to um, a project called Ancient Connections, which is creating a new pilgrimage route between St David's in Pembrokeshire and Ferns in Wexford. Um, just sorry, just some people arriving. Um, and uh, this project takes its inspiration from a Welsh hymn, uh, which is called Pererin Oiv, which means I am a pilgrim. Now, um, the project uh, has a, a number of strands of activity. Um, one of which is this series of online seminars that you're attending tonight. And um, shortly we'll be hearing from our speaker tonight, David Greenslade, who's, uh, who will be talking about his experience of um, the Welsh diaspora. Um, but before um, I introduce David and, and he presents, I, I want to, uh, to show us, uh, to show you here, because I know a lot of people here tonight weren't at the first session, um, our, uh, the other strand of our project, which is a, an online map where we were asking people to um, pin, uh, pin themselves, uh, like a recording of themselves or their choir or musical group um, singing the song Pererin Oiv. Um, I should explain that Pererin Oiv is often sung to the tune of Amazing Grace. Um, but we're also um, asking for people to sing uh, or, or inviting people to sing any song that might connect to um, to uh, our themes of um, of pilgrimage, of journeying, of home and return. So um, I'm just going to uh, show you the map again. Um, and I wonder if I could ask um jake to put the link to the map um in the chat uh okay here's here's the map now i wanted to show you the map just to show you um that actually this week we have had somebody has um uh pinned a song uh to to the map um rosemary who's here tonight has um has sent sent in a song and i'm actually gonna gonna start this session by playing Rosemary's song um, and uh, Rosemary is, is um, in, uh, in West Wales um, and I, yeah here is her song. Hello my name's Rosemary Graham and I live in West Wales I'm going to sing for you One More Step Along the World I Go one more step along the world I go, one more step along the world I go, from the old things to the new, keep me travelling along with you, and it's from the old I travel to the new, keep me travelling along with you, round the corners of the world I turn, more and more about the world I learn, and a new things that I see you'll be looking at along with me and it's from the old I travel to the new keep me traveling along with you 
As I travel through the bad and good, keep me traveling the way I should. Where I see no way to go, you'll be telling me the way I know. And it's from the old I travel to the new, keep me traveling along with you. Give me courage when the world is rough. Keep me loving when the world is tough. Leap and sing in all I do. Keep me traveling along with you. And it's from the old I travel to the new. Keep me traveling along with you. You are older than the world can be. You are younger than the life in me. Ever old and ever new. Keep me traveling along with you. And it's from the old I travel to the new. Keep me traveling along with you. Wow. Brilliant. Well, thank you, Hi. Rosemary. Um, I, don't, I don't know if you want to say anything about more about that song. Okay, yes. Um, it's a hymn I'm very fond of. It's by somebody called Sidney Carter. And uh, when I was a teacher, it's something we used to sing in assemblies a lot. And I was always very fond of it. It always meant a lot to me. And to me, it is like being a pilgrim, a pilgrim in life. And my life feels so it's been on a pilgrimage, which is still going on. And um, yeah, it just seemed it just seemed appropriate to me. I'm sorry I sound hoarse at the end, but I have a, a lung condition which I last out for so long and then it gives up. But yes, and I enjoyed it. I found it quite a challenge to do, but I enjoyed doing it. And I'm glad it was successful. So yeah, it's a lo lovely song. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing it with us. Um, so yeah, uh, Rosemary did send me her video. Um, uh, so so I, I put it on the map to her, but I thought I would just while we're here just go through the process of um sharing something on the map again um so to pin something to the map you move this red target arrow to the place where you want to put it um you choose this symbol if you want to put a, a youtube video or if you want to put notes or a picture you choose this plus and then you click here for picture and i'm going to find the collage um so right at the start of the ancient connections project there was a, a kind of open meeting in st david's about the the hopes for the project um uh, and the pilgrimage route is something that's come uh, come come out of those very early stages um and at that uh, sort of public meeting there was a a kind of exercise at the end of it where everybody present made made a collage so um i'm just uh putting that on the map uh, just to show you that it is also possible to um share images um on the map um and you then close that down and your image is on the map okay um, so I'm going to stop uh, sharing now, but um, the reason that I wanted to, to show that possibility is that it kind of connects um, with uh, some of my, some of the speaker tonight's work, um, David Greenslade, who is, um, is our guest speaker tonight, um, who is uh, not a singer, uh, but a, a, a definitely a wordsmith, a poet, uh, and also an artist. Um, now, uh, a while ago, I came across, um, totally by accident really, a copy of David's book, Welsh Fever, which he's going to talk about uh, tonight um, in a bookshop in Cardiff. Um, and... Uh, yeah, I just wanted to connect back to um, Professor James's talk last week. We were—he he was telling us about a hymn that William Williams wrote, not Pererinoiv, 
but um, Dros y Bryniau Tywyll Newlog that he connected uh, with the Preseli Hills. So Dros y Bryniau Tywyll Newlog is over the dark and gloomy hills. And um, it's thought that William Williams wrote this hymn um, at Llwyn Gwyr Manor, which is sort of in the in the shadow of the Preselis and, and Carningley in particular. Um, but in, in, the, in the opening pages of David's book, I just want to, to, to read a little quote, which, um, well, it goes like this. A plateau without peaks. The Ozarks are gentler than the southern Ochitars and are a lot like the Welsh Preselis. Vastly different in fauna, they are similar in topography, with the highest Ozark peak being 1,772 feet on Tuam Soak Mountain, and the Preselis at 1,760 feet on Voile Cum Cadwyn. They are similar too in their shallow glades, abundance of clean, swift streams, and the beauty of southern unexpected hamlets. So that's just a flavour of some of David's writing and um, really connects to the themes of um, uh, ho well, home and away and um, uh, this exploration of, of sort of Welsh identity in relation to the diaspora and, and people who, who, who moved there um, and uh, re-experiencing re um, one's home place somewhere else perhaps. Uh, which I think is um, is what David is is going to sort of speak about. Um, I, it, David will be talking about perceptions of Wales from far away and the peaks and troughs of re-experiencing Wales as a journey of eternal return. His presentation will be informed by experience of Buddhist pilgrimage, the Welsh diaspora in North America and Canada, and now living on the street where he was born whilst also living abroad in Romania. And I think his presentation will also introduce a lot more of his work too. So I'm going to leave it at that and I'm going to hand over to you, David. Thank you. Thank you, Rohan. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to make a formal start then by thanking Rohan very much for the invitation. And that goes like this. I was very happy and surprised to receive an invitation from Rowan to take part in this truly fascinating artistic project, Pared and Oiv, Ancient Connections. And I'd like to thank Wynne James for his presentation two weeks ago, he gave me a lot of pointers on how to manage this week. And thanks to Jacob for his uh, technical assistance. I have no idea if participants can see me. Can, can you let me know? Yes, okay. we can see you on a small screen, uh, Davis. Okay, thanks. So I'm trying my best to have eye contact onto the screen and keep to the, the points I'd like to make. So thank you very much. Pereira Noiv, Ancient Connections, appeals for artistic creativity, which, yes, with Rowan, I really believe is vitally important for anyone interested in the relationship between Wales and the wider world. After hearing from Rowan, either that evening or the next day, I, I was very inspired by the chat. I, I regularly make and uh, show my collages in different places, and I'd always wanted to make um, a rugby collage, so I made this right away. Uh, I show my collages in libraries usually, and Romania has some fantastic libraries with cabinets. So I made this, and these are some other examples of the visual work I do. And these will be shown in uh, Timisoara, which will be the European capital of culture uh, next year. But my story of pilgrimage and connection with the diaspora starts by moving away from Wales. In 1977, I took the train to London, from London to Calais, from Calais to Moscow, one night in Moscow and then the Trans-Siberian to Vladivostok and on to Yokohama. I went to Japan at the age of 24 because I 
consciously wanted to change my life. And I felt that the transition from one culture in Wales to another culture in Japan should be managed slowly. I funded this journey by working for two years as a lighthouse keeper along the south coast of England. This was one of my lighthouses, the Needles in the Isle of Wight, another one, the Hanwha Lighthouse off Jersey, and lighthouses all along the south coast. On the lighthouse, not a lot to do, lots of reading. And I discovered the poetry of Miyazawa Kenji. Japanese poet I still find very fascinating. And my plan was to go to Miyazawa Kenji's memorial house in Northern Japan to find a job there and basically to take an enormous chance with the writings of Miyazawa Kenji as my inspiration and my sense of hope. I learned the Japanese phrase, shegoto wo kudasai, and things worked out unexpectedly well. I spent my first day in Japan, um, July the 5th, 1977, by taking the train north. The following day, I went to the city hall in, in Morioka, and I met this tourism officer, Mr. Kikuchi, and he took me to buy a dictionary. He asked me in a very straightforward manner, why have you come to Japan? And I suddenly realized the other side of the world, this was really not a trivial question. I told Mr. Kikuchi, I want to study Zen. He calmly replied, would you like to visit a temple? The first temple he took me to at the time didn't have an abbot. The monk who met us was a chain smoker, nicotine fingers, the works, and very dismissive, very rude. Just as he was leave, just as we were leaving, that monk told Mr. Kikuchi there was a new temple outside of town. Here the experience was completely different. The building was new, not ancient, and the monk who greeted us was very firm and very abrupt. He took us to a meeting room where we knelt around a small table and after an interview, of which I could only understand the gist, this monk wheeled on me ferociously and roared at me in English, I take you, you obey. So by now my legs were throbbing with pain from sitting in this Japanese kneeling position of seiza, some of you may know it. I blurted out, Yes, sure, obey, yes, anything, I'll obey. The pain was really unendurable. The interview was over. On my second day in Japan, I had found a temple where for the next two years, I would be a student of Zen. A monk, Tato Tekkan, he became my friend and it was he who gave me the basic painful training, enabling me to become a disciple of Zen abbot Ban Tetsugu Roshi, and that's him in the front in the golden robes that I am. I regarded my journey to Japan as a quest to change my life. The Miyazawa Kenji poetry portion would be a stepping stone along the way. In fact, I wouldn't get to visit the poet's house until a year later. And then I went as a tourist, not as a pilgrim. I had instead become a student of Ban Roshi. And these were my Zen student licenses. It really felt strangely inevitable. I really can't explain the miraculous good fortune I had in meeting this man. While studying as a Zen monk, I made two obligatory, but fairly nominal pilgrimages to uh, Zen centers, Eheji and Sojiji. These were weekend long events involving bathing, chanting, special clothes, etc., all the hallmarks of pilgrimage. So I completed rituals here, 
And meanwhile, back in Ban Roshi's temple and the temple in the north of Japan, I learned Japanese and a completely new way of life, training all the while under the guidance of the abbot Ban Roshi, his students. And this involved very strict rules, daily Zazen meditation and interviews with the abbot himself. Briefly, we were joined by this gentleman in the middle from France, who's a student in Paris, and the other man on the right from Sri Lanka. At first, in this experience, I was allowed to have a social life outside of the temple. Then one day in a coffee shop in Tokyo, I saw a woman reading a book about whales. I told her I was Welsh, and she asked me, in Welsh, if I spoke the Jap if I spoke the language, I said I didn't. While in Japan, I met my American wife, Suzanne. After a final year in Kyoto, we returned to Wales and made a commitment to learning Welsh. But after working for Berlitz and Imlingua, this experience in Wales was crushingly disappointing. The classes came to nothing. After a short stay in Wales, in 1981, we left for America and traveling in a VW camper van, made a tour of the United States. This tour is documented in my first book, Welsh Fever. I now regard this, and soon afterwards did as well, I regard this as a very, very naive book. And reactions to it at the time ranged from generous praise, thank you very much, but also brutal contempt. Whoever compiled the Wikipedia entry, Welsh Americans, Welsh fever is not listed among the 20 or so further reading references. Even so, I believe this book did make a contribution to the nature of Welsh pro projects in Canada, the USA and in Wales. It also records how the St. David's Society of Atlanta, Georgia started. While meeting people in North America with an interest in Wales, I paid close attention to the nature of Welsh societies and what they did. I hugely enjoyed meeting the people that ran them all over the United States. All of this is in the book. This is a shot of the tour we made. It lasted a year and a half. And the details of how I started meeting Welsh people, at first quite by chance, then intentionally, is recorded in the book. When it came to setting up the Welsh Society in Atlanta, Georgia, I soon realized, pretty soon realized, that even though I embodied a certain perspective on Wales, simply by being born there, I felt very limited in what I knew, what I was able to access, and, as a result, what I was able to share. Welsh societies across America, there are many more than these shown, they have all sorts of perspectives of their own. For ordinary Americans, unlike Scotland with kilts and bagpipes, mentioning Wales evokes almost no image at all. As first president of the Welsh Society of Atlanta, Georgia, having studied and experienced the programs of other Welsh societies, I organized what I thought was a pretty competent program of events. We also ran a weekly Welsh language class. After this paragraph, perhaps you can pause, it became clear pretty soon that even while having my photograph taken with Tom Jones, no less, having a March the First dinner, raising money for the 1984 miners' strike, representing Wales at the British consulate, and connecting with the Celtic theatre in Atlanta, my ability to promote an idea of Wales felt personally inadequate. So the next part, I'm going to talk about the 
society in Atlanta, Georgia. Then after that, I'll talk about returning to Wales itself. Uh, Rowan, for me to catch my breath, I wonder if anyone would like to ask anything or if you'd like to comment right now. Well, would anybody like to, to ask anything of, um, of David so far? I can crack on. Um, Could I ask something? Yes, please. Oh, hi. Hi. Very, very interesting, all of this, David. Thank you so much. Um, did you go to Tennessee at all? My son lives in Tennessee in the mountains, and he said there's quite a lot of evidence of Welsh people having lived around there in Welsh language. Yes. Um, Knoxville is in Tennessee. We didn't connect with the Welsh people in Tennessee at that time on that trip. But since then, people from Tennessee have visited me in Wales. Oh. And the Welsh story in Tennessee, if I recall, I think it's Samuel Jones. Uh, this was a, a parish to parish uh, project uh, where a parish went from Wales, they were sold land, they were told it was uh, rich and productive land, but it turned out to be the most useless land imaginable, hilly, forested, gloomy. So that's a, a very interesting and rather well documented story, actually. Thank you. Yeah, if you, I think it's Samuel, it's either Samuel Joan or Samuel Thomas, but he was quite a, a figure in Wales. He was a writer. He may have been the first person to suggest a, uni, a universal price for postage, no matter where in the country you were in one of his essays. And he's really worth, um, yeah, it's a, it's a great story worth investigating. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so I'm in Atlanta, Georgia now. We've had this wonderful experience of meeting not only Welsh people, but all kinds of people, which is shown in the book. Um, Amish, Sioux Indians, a very strong contact there. Germans in Texas, Basques in Idaho. And we stayed with Arturo and Olga Roberts in New Jersey, the founder of the newspaper Ninai. I met the uh, Jane Prather, who was the co-founder of Ninai. And these people were saying, when you go to Atlanta, you must start a Welsh society. I don't think it would have occurred to me. But I attended Welsh evenings, uh, recording sessions, all kinds of events in San Francisco, uh, Minneapolis. And so I thought, yeah, this sounds like it's going to be a lot of fun. So the actual beginning is in the book. And again, we had a massive article in the Atlanta Constitution. And lo and behold, the next thing we had a St. David's dinner for 80 people. But as I say, as much fun as this was, as the year went ahead, I felt there was something missing. And we decided to return to Wales, which I was very much looking forward to. And I was going to prioritize returning to the Welsh language. While in America, I seemed to have positioned myself for a return to my own ancient connections. There was one event in particular as documented in Welsh Fever, hearing Welsh spoken between distant cousins of my mother's while crossing Oakland Bay Bridge in a very big American car, driving towards the skyline of San Francisco. Hearing Welsh under these circumstances was a moment of magical epiphany. An epiphany I felt it was important to explore. It would be an exploration filled with genuine optimism. And now I'm going to share the story of my return to Wales. Now this return has a very uneasy, uncomfortable side to it, but I think we manage it pretty well. I'll conclude with some observations on diaspora, living as I currently do 
genuinely between two countries, a house in Wales on the street where I grew up and a house in Eastern Europe in Romania. In 1984, we returned to Wales, bought a house in Kevin Cribble and prioritized commu commuting to Cardiff for the well-known Welsh Language for Adults course founded by Chris Rees. I then took A-levels in Welsh and later a shortened BA and an MA in teaching Welsh. I contributed articles to Ninai and started a Wales America newsletter called the Welsh American Monitor, Welsh Language Monitor. So very involved in Welsh life. I want to account for the experience of relearning my language, which I spoke as a child. And this book, Burning Down the Dosbath, the Dosbath means a classroom where you learn Welsh. And I was very angry that I had to relearn my language as opposed to having retained it at home. So this book documents that return. But what is not documented, but only hinted at in this book, is the following story. Chris Rees, the teacher, suggested that returners to the language, such as myself, might interview older people in their family and ask them about their grandparents and great uncles and great aunts. These recollections, he pointed out, would invariably be in Welsh. So it was that I called innocently on my dear auntie Agnes, Agnes Shell, and not another auntie, Agnes May Owen, as recorded in this book, that's Life, Isn't It? by John Mason. On return to Wales, I had visited many shrines, probably all of them almost. Nantgoythern, the Welsh Learning Centre, the Eisteddfod, the Annual Festival, residential courses in Lampeter, Abergavenny, Carmarthen, quiz nights for learners, treasure hunts, the Welsh Language Society, the Welsh Learners Society, the Welsh Bridging Society for incomers, Plaid Cymru and the Cavamodwyr, whose secretary, by the way, was R.S. Thomas. So I enjoyed a brief correspondence with the poet R.S. Thomas. I became chair of the local nursery school, chair of the local newsletter. I founded the Militant Action Group, Fathers for Bilingual Education, been in court, protesting, painted out road signs. That was weird fun been on radio and television. So it's quite a CV, campaign, campaigned for a new Welsh Language Act. And I was at the Park Hotel in 1997 for the night of the devolution result. I'd even come first in the Gwent Glamorgan Learner of the Year competition, an honor I had to relinquish because we were returning to America for the summer and we wouldn't be around for the finals. Interviewing, Auntie Agnes, there she is, was simply one more step in my all-consuming commitment to getting to know my country and understand what I felt had limited me while leading the Welsh Society in Atlanta. It was from Atlanta, 4,000 miles away, that our weekly Welsh language class had progressed as far as the conditional mood quite a different, difficult stage in any language. Basun, Baset, Basem, I would, he would, and so on. And it was during her reminiscences that Auntie Agnes was very fond of this conversational tick, reinforcing her anecdotes with, oh yeah, Basenweer, Basse, Basse, Basenweer. It was when we started discussing my mother's childhood that things took a very different turn. My mother's mother, Ennis, had migrated to the South Wales coalfield from Newcastle Emlyn in West Wales. There was only one photograph of my deceased grandmother, Ennis, taken before she got married, and that photograph has disappeared. She came to work in the South Wales coalfield at the Plough Inn, Kevin Cribble. This is where she met my maternal grandfather, Charles Shell. They had three daughters. 
this is the Plow Inn, as I recall it, in 1966. It's uh, someone's house by now. I'm 15 years old. So my grandmother Ennis and my grandfather Charles had three daughters. My mother, my mother was two years old when Ennis died, giving birth to the third daughter. Charles and his three young daughters moved back in with his young parents, his parents, his parents, excuse me, and his two younger sisters. So that's um, a very overcrowded miners cottage. Everyone spoke Welsh. Here's a photograph of my dear mother. When she died, my father stapled her photograph to the wall and he managed to put a staple right through her cheek. We don't have many family photographs in my family, but there's my mother a second time on the right. She's probably about 18 years old here maximum. And my father's mother, the other grandmother over there on the left. From the information after hours of interviews that Agnes was giving me, I realized that windows were opening onto very dark domestic experiences that had been completely hidden from me. I was hearing this through the now rare working class Gwenhoiseg dialect of Mid Glamorgan, and I've got it on tape. I confirmed everything she told me by having some very difficult conversations with my mother and father. But Rowan and I, we've decided that this dark aspect of my return to Wales is not really suitable for the current project. And sincerely, if anyone wishes to contact me about this, I'm open to the possibility of saying more about it. It's true though, that I undertook this quest as a pilgrimage. And I believe it's fair to say that I did find the pearl of great price, even, it was, even if it was very difficult. Enough to say, I was making the journey as a pilgrim from the fractured to the integrated, which is how Heather Warfield describes the experience of pilgrimage. Also, this was a clear case of a pilgrim needing to be careful about what he wishes for. I can only add that this difficult experience has enriched my life and not diminished it. By the 1990s, I was securely established in Wales, even if the immersion had become traumatic. When I published Cambrian Country with an introduction by Jan Morris, that was an experience in itself. This tour in this book of Welsh iconography became a study of the missing symbolism that I felt had been deficient within myself and within larger frames of reference, particularly in America. I later published Imagined Invited, an international collection of deliberately Wales forecast, Wales focused surreal collage and writing. This led to an even greater abundance of international collaborative activity with my most recent book this year being published in the Netherlands. Now I'd like to give a shout out to this absolutely fascinating magazine, Poetry Salzburg Review, which the editor genuinely regards as a magazine of writing from the English speaking diaspora, publishing work from all over the world. A lot of Welsh writers, a lot of Irish writers and others writing in English, wherever they are. Through these experiences, I'm convinced that the arts have an important role to play in the imaginative patterning of Wales.
whether at home or in faraway places. As such, I established the arts collective Archipelago, hosting an annual unit at the Estedford and further afield. With the late artist William Brown, I was giving presentations of the Mary Lloyd, which is a Welsh uh, mumming tradition. I gave presentations studying the very high probability of Roman ritual blending with Celtic mythic roots. I organized an exhibition for William while working in Oman. Here's another exhibition while in the Middle East. All the time representing Wales, but not quite in the form of a, a Welsh society as in the United States. By now, completing a PhD, teaching Welsh, giving talks, writing articles, books, traveling to Europe, I was also reviewing every phase of my life through the traumatic residue of my own family story. This autobiographical shock was stabilized by traveling throughout Wales, in Welsh and in English, publishing, curating, exhibiting, as well as deep time immersion into mythic as well as personal origins. This kind of immersion is a well-known aspect of pilgrimage, the time, space, physicality of the commitment, along with greater or lesser reflection and meditation. Now, dwelling with maximum accountability as best I could within my own Welsh story, this made my pilgrimage of return all the more worthwhile. So now a caveat. It isn't an obligation for everyone, whether having lived away or not, to try and fully recall their own domestic and cultural context. But for me, it was. Participation in diaspora is highly subjective. And the extent to which an individual or a group engages with the home country, well, it comes without a guidebook. There's no instruction manual. I describe my experience to this extent because it had become essential to challenge the context I'd been given. The very positive, the very convivial model of the Welsh society of Atlanta, Georgia, with all its endearing limitations, is just one experience that led me to rethink individual and group behavior within the spectrum of Welsh imagination. Ultimately, I chose the arts. This is an exhibition, I, uh, 26 participants, 12 countries. I put on earlier this year in Swansea. Uh, Wales, Romanian, exhibition at the Senedd of a Welsh Parliament in 2019 and the latest and ongoing an exhibition of collages at libraries in Romania. It's within the arts that I feel reasonably competent and this is where I find that uh, a reinvention of Wales finds fertile ground. It's my view that diaspora activities no longer need to be confined to the same forms of nostalgia, dragons and Welsh cakes. One way that this spectrum can change is through more enlivening contemporary methods of contact, such as the Wales Smithsonian event of 2019. A current example would be the very recent Welsh Week hosted in Philadelphia. There is the annual North American Festival of Wales. And I was there when the organization changed its name some years ago. This festival has a very clever blend of memory and contemporary program of events. I'm not aware though, that the festival has a best practice window where the leaders of widely scattered Welsh groups share best efforts of contemporary links 
while also renewing their historic roots. Other diasporas, such as those of Romania, which I'm involved with, Ireland, which I'm only vaguely aware of, I believe they have more influence and connect with their homelands in ways quite different from we Welsh. And there are reasons for this. One, rather than having a nation state as a resource, the Welsh diaspora is that of a devolved region, a region fragmented even in the Senate by very uneven attitudes towards language, heritage, and the almost taboo subject of in-migration, in migration of indifferent and even sometimes hostile populations. My experience of the Welsh, mainly historic diaspora in the USA and Canada, that of the 1960s brain drain, was a process of re-recognizing Wales in response to a great many encounters, not one single event. For example, meeting Mary Lloyd in Cambria, Wisconsin. Mary came in 1910, first to Montreal by ship, then by train to Chicago. She was 24 hours early for her reunion with her brother. This is in the book. And there was a Nobel Prize winner in Chicago at that time. And that lady personally came and escorted Mary to the hostel overnight. For me, Mary Lloyd completely embodied the story of leaving Wales, Anglesey, and settling in America. The afternoon tea I had with Mary was almost exactly like having tea with my own aunties when I was a child. Contrast between having tinned condensed milk over tinned fruit with all the other diets, Italian, Japanese, German, we'd experienced on our travels in America was one of pure nostalgia within the USA of 1982. In Eastern Washington state, we were shown one of the most interesting cemeteries I'd ever seen. This is explained in the book on page 62. Many of the gravestones in the Lincoln County Prairie Cemetery were in Welsh, but I didn't speak Welsh then, and the headstones were a mystery. The story of Almira is a very interesting one from the Welsh emigrant perspective, and it's still unexplored. While my first book, Welsh Fever, has glaring faults, this is one of the reasons I'm sad that it isn't listed on the Wikipedia page. Welsh Fever does point out a lot of opportunities for more research. I'm approaching the end of the text now. Writing Welsh Fever on a manual typewriter, relying mainly on back copies of Ninai and Edrych in days before the internet, served so two functions. One, it gave me an opportunity to crystallize the experience of the recent tour. Two, it taught me that telling a non-fiction story obliges the narrator to be a responsible witness. I began to conclude that the stories of Wales that I'd been given when growing up, midway between Swansea and Cardiff, were lacking in many ways. The multitude of stories I'd heard and participated in when traveling around North America were only a partial correction. The next step would be a return to Wales, where with each step taken, I realized that issues of identity can rarely be resolved, but are rather a process of reconciliation and even conflict between cultural and personal forces. Linguistic, political, social, domestic, acceptance, 
even denial, etc. The diaspora played a role for me and still plays a role, but not as a uniform identity, not as a uniform ideal or duty where one lens views all the possibilities. Following the publication of Welsh Fever and a tour of sentient cities in America to promote it, other Welsh projects worth researching were drawn to my attention. Particularly interesting is the story of the Welsh tract at Rose Hill, North Carolina. The Welsh tract is referred to in Welsh Fever, but the reference is undeveloped. I've since been to Rose Hill and seen for myself pontoons for carrying tar owned by Welsh settlers. Tar collected for the British Navy. These pontoons, because they carry tar, sit preserved in the creeks of North Carolina. It's a really interesting story with a lot more investigation. So I'd like to thank you for your indulgence. And it's my hope that these, I confess, admittedly personal and possibly slightly alien reflections on the importance of authenticity, or in Welsh, perthin, between oneself and country, might help other investigations into diaspora, distance, pilgrimage, as well as a, a reinvigoration of national and personal relationship. <laughs> this is where I hope to exhibit next year the British School in Timisoara, Capital of Culture. We are negotiating um, how to manage it. This photograph was taken just a few weeks ago in Romania. And now, the only one I cannot say is the third one. I can't pronounce it, excuse me. Diolchenwaur, thank you. Shukran Gazilan, Arigato Gozaimas, Mutsumesk Fartimult. And up at the top right, this arrived today, and it's a book from Romania, 30 Romanian writers in exile. 30 Romanian writers in exile, 1945 to 1989. And it shows for me, anyway, there's a vast difference between a very large country like Romania and its diaspora and what our, dia our Welsh diaspora valiantly continues to do. And I really look forward to a discussion, questions, and thank you very much for listening. Diolch and Vaur, David, thank you very much um, for a really uh, fascinating, thought-provoking um, talk. Um, I guess I'd start by saying um, when I picked up your book in Cardiff's Oxfam bookshop, mm. um, it, it was a, a very uh, surprising book to me. Perhaps uh, I, I, I didn't expect what I found in that book um, and uh, what it struck me is that, um, um, well, I, I, I hope that it will get added to the list on Wikipedia now. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was a, a, a quite a strange document of, of obviously your, your time um, and um, you sort of call it a naive now. Um, and uh, partly I felt um, perhaps naive um, in a way, uh, asking you to, to return to this work at, uh, at this stage. Obviously, you, you, you wrote that book, um, you know, as, as a young man, and you've, you've had many experiences now since then that you've, you've shared with us tonight. Um, uh, but yes, I, I absolutely agree. I still, I think that book has incredible value in, in documenting that time, an incredible amount of leads um, 
as a, as a, as a starting point to, to really investigate um, that Welsh identity in America, but also how that does impact on centres of identity back home in Wales. Um, so yes, you if you wanted to respond to that. Yeah, um, can I introduce Janet Francis? And my cursor is over Janet there. Just before leaving America to, to return to Wales, Janet from Neath, who had been teaching in Spain, relocated to Atlanta, Georgia. And Janet, I wonder, Rowan, if it's okay with you, and okay with you, Janet, if you'd like to say something about how it how you came to meet the Welsh Society and the direction it took, if you don't mind. Yeah, carry on. Oh, that's fine. That, yeah, yes. Hello, everybody. This, uh, can you hear me? Am I? Yeah. yeah. Um, gosh, listening to you there, David, brought back so many memories. <laughs> um, and it is uh, through you, of course, that I got to the uh, St. Da St. David Society. If you recall, I had been in, I, I studied in North Wales in Bangor, and so all my certificates were in Welsh. So I applied for this job in America and sent my qualifications and my certificates, forgetting that I needed to translate them. So when they arrived on the desk of the head teacher of the school where I worked, he uh, just didn't know what to do with them. So somebody had said there must be a society, there must be somebody somewhere in Atlanta who could speak Welsh. And they contacted somehow uh, Olwen, I think David, her name was. Olwen Zander from Machanlleth. That's right, and she was from Machanlleth, and she was a Welsh speaker. And um, they sent my certificates to her. She translated them. And if I remember correctly, David, you sort of perked up when you knew that there was going to be an actual Welsh speaker coming to Atlanta to live. And I was in my second day there at a meeting in school, which hadn't opened yet. And the phone rang in the office and somebody said, oh, Janet, there's a, a, a phone call for you. Well, I'd been there for two days. Who on earth was going to ring me after two days in Atlanta? And it was David who had tracked me down and uh, got me involved into the um, society, which, uh, yeah, something I'm very grateful for. Yeah, so the programme was already pretty good. I don't want to talk myself down. The programme was quite successful. We kept our numbers up and yeah. then it was over to Janet and the programme expanded into, in addition to monthly social meetings, music nights, potluck dinners in the park, boot sales. Being sociable was a very important, we didn't, it wasn't programmatic. I also had a, a weekly um, Welsh lesson. Yes. Um, nine or ten very faithful uh, Welsh students who came and learned Welsh. Yeah, so Welsh is taught in Japan, I discovered. I made contact with that. It's taught in, um, in Lublin, Poland, Berlin. Um, there's, there's a really a, a fair amount of... Um, projects going on, but they aren't gathered as the projects of other countries are and catalogued. I've, I've been made aware of Global Scotland, for example. I know someone wanted to start Global Welsh, but I don't know if it's gone anywhere and nobody's assigned it from the Senate, for example. There's no civil servant assigned to coordinate these things, which I think is a shame. If you remember as well, if I, talking about um, moving and, and people living and leaving, we were at a restaurant one night and we were chatting about, um, because we had never met before. And my, there's, Alan is here, my, Alan Howell, he's here. Um, Jay, we were talking together, if you remember, David, and it turned out that you had been in Virginia. Charles, Virginia, yeah. Uh, and you had friends in Charlottesville who were friends of my cousin there, Alan. That's right. That's one of those very Welsh, who do you know, who do I know? We'll soon find someone in common. But there's a word for that, isn't it? Six persons removed or something. Yeah. But we, for us, it was much more direct. I wonder if anyone has any questions or observations about diaspora, really. 
I wonder, David, just um, it's talking there about, oh, sorry, Paul's got his hand up. Um, I was just going to, Paul, do you want to ask? Sorry. Yeah, I, um, I mean, I think the talk is absolutely fascinating. Uh, I'm just wondering about, you know, why Wales doesn't appear uh, um, like Scotland, you mentioned uh, Ireland as well, uh, Romania. Is it something about the Welsh personality, for want of a better word? I, I've written some words down uh, around um, inferiority complex, we're insular. Friends of mine who I work with in Scotland say, well, the trouble with Wales is you're a conquered nation. Scotland <laughs> is not a conquered nation. Um, what do you think about that? Well, I do think about it quite. I've reflected on it a lot. That's why I wrote Cambrian Country. It's a collection of uh, potentially 50 or 60 icons, if you like. Some parts are very ironic, like the corgis are featured, the Queen's corgis. They are Welsh, the Welsh cob. Um, what if we suddenly were given budgets to project ourselves? How would that happen? I mean, I don't know if people know what the Marie Lloyd is. It's a, it's a mumming tradition around the period of New Year where you go to door with a horse's skull and there's a song and um, a performance up at the threshold. But this is being revived by some people. But living as I do now in Eastern Europe, some familiarity with the Balkans, Romania, definitely. They've got dozens of these mumming traditions, dozens and dozens, and they can fill a town square with any number of um, folk happenings like this. And, and we've been reduced to one, which is a shame. Some people are trying to fight back. There was a television program quite a few years ago. Was it called The Golden Years or something about a young boy and he had a Jewish friend. It's an American TV program. Somebody's nodding. And I remember watching it once and the Jewish friend was having a bar mitzvah and he asks his mum, I thought it was a terrific program myself, mum, who am I? You know, he's Jewish, he's having a bar mitzvah with a band and he made it feel cool. And she, re she recalls their family background. Well, your great granddad was a settler, your great grandma was, I think, grandma was Welsh, but she never said much about it. And so we have these very tangential mentions of the Welsh. But the Welsh are also um, believed to have so successfully integrated without carrying any not not baggage but without carrying traditions they just they just vanished into the american melting pot as it were the societies do a valiant job i think without really as i did clearly knowing how to access who would they contact do you Who's think there? there's do you think there's a generational change so uh, two sides of my family uh, emigrated from wales to canada one uh, in the late twenties, to Drumheller, like I guess, was a mining community from a mining community to a mining community, uh, and then the next generation down, different side of the family, uh, uh, went to Montreal in the when was I born? It, it, late fifties. Now, the that generation is very much looking back through amber-coloured glasses uh, at everything. They, my cousins, who are my generation, are much more interested in the politics of Wales. They were interested in, in the, the royal funerals, what was going on, and we, we were emailing each other across three continents. And, and my cousin in Canada was asking us about things and said, well, actually, it's not quite, it's not quite what you think in Wales. Yeah. Uh, yeah, in Canada, I found that people were more interested in British politics than in the United States. I think the political setup in Canada um, is quite different from America, which I follow closely, actually. And I find that Americans really have no idea how politics works in Britain. I'll give you an example. I was at the Welsh Festival in San Jose, and Rodri Morgan was the guest speaker. And Rodri was hurling around 
uh, catchphrases like uh, not quite peace, love, but uh, <laughs> peace, fairness, and social justice for all. And my cousin was there. She lives in Las Vegas at the time. Social justice for all. This must be 15 years ago. I mean, she was outraged. And she said, this is America, for God's sake. This every man. Blah, blah. And she actually stormed out of the banquet. And you could sense a, a kind of a wave of indifference come over the audience when Rodri uh, um, pulled out political slogans. If Rodri had kept to um, images from heritage, shall we say, not necessarily the golden perfect landscape, but less of a political emphasis, I think he would have kept the audience with him. As it was, he lost the audience. The same with the mayor of Cardiff, when he spoke at the Welsh festival in Harrisburg. One of the worst um, speeches to an audience, talk about misreading the room, I'd ever seen. People actually started shuffling the china when the mayor of Cardiff, who the Americans thought would be a prize speaker, he was absolutely useless, could not relate to the Americans at all. Really interesting, thank you. Yeah. Um, is there anybody else? I think um, I can see Heaven's got his hand up. Yeah, can I thank David for his uh, hotel history of his life's pilgrimage? Extremely interesting. I noticed you said that you were a, a native of Kevin Kribur. Indeed. And that rang a bell with me. Possibly you are a contemporary of Howard Max. I am indeed. Well, now then, and I think you spent some time in America in a indeed, penitentiary, indeed. if I remember correctly. That's right. I do remember when he came back to Wales, he was interviewed occasionally, and he still had a, a slight grasp of, of Welsh from his childhood days and a very strong Gwen Huiseg accent. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, therefore, since you shared your upbringing in the same areas, whether you can share any of his experience in, in any way. I can share stories of Howard. Everyone in the district has a Howard Mark story, <laughs> like everyone in Swansea has a Dylan Thomas story. Now, I don't know if everyone knows that Howard is famous for being um, a very successful international cannabis smuggler. And he's a very good writer. His book, Mr. Nice, describes uh, his adventures in cannabis land. When we were younger, Howard and I were dating two sisters. I dated the younger sister and Howard dated uh, Diane and Helen. But Howard was sentenced to 17, 18, 19 years in a Ted Hort Penitentiary, Indiana. And by chance, another girl from Kenfig Hill, her husband, his speciality was, was actually penitentiary studies or something. And Howard's father kept his rank as Captain Marks, they were known. So when they went to visit Howard, they were able to stay with Elaine from Kenfig Hill. Now, when Howard was sent to prison, Captain and Mrs. Marks went around the district asking everyone if they would correspond with Howard. Because very intelligent man, a degree from Oxford, Mr. Nice is a fantastic read. And uh, yeah, we did. People around the area wrote letters to Howard and got replies. A more recent story is um, when he was still alive. He only died about two years ago. The Kenfield Gill Rugby Club locally wanted to host a fundraising and Howard being the most famous son of Kenfield Hill, was invited to be the speaker. But when they discovered what Howard was famous for, they refused to have him on the premises. So it was the Labour Club who hosted Howard. He spoke about drug smuggling. So the Labour Club hosted him and the rugby club received the money. When Howard came home, which was often, he would go to the Royal Oak and the place would just fill up. Or he's famous for being a marijuana smuggler. So just as everyone has had a drink with Dylan Thomas, everyone around here has smoked a joint with uh, Howard Marks, that's for sure. Very good writer. Thank you. Uh, and to be fair, there's no getting Kenfig Hill out of Howard Marks. I was talking about this with a friend today, David Rhys Davis. 
David Rhys Davis, former head of art at Kingston University, now lives in Brighton. I mean, David is a diaspora of one because his, his paintings feature uh, South Wales very much. Uh, a lot of it images of Wales all through David's wild and surreal work. And I regard him as a diaspora of one. Not everyone is obliged to, to form a group or a society. Just imagine, Rowan, if you found yourself in wherever, Australia, Canada, what does it mean to start a, uh, a diaspora society? What would one do? Okay. Yeah, well, um, I, I, so that sort of brings me to a question I was going to ask um, around almost just how you actually, I think how you started to write the book or why you wrote, you, you, you know, you didn't go to America with that intention of writing Welsh Fever. It sort of happened, as I understand it, it sort of happened by accident. Absolutely. Before leaving for America, we went to a lot of trouble because we'd heard, you know, these, the way they talk here in the village. Oh, I hear they speak Welsh in South America. But duh, just look it up. So here, there was, oh, you know, they're Welsh. They're Welsh people in America. The Indians spoke Welsh, all this nonsense. So I made a great effort to meet a chap called John Albert Evans. And John Albert Evans had taught Welsh in America with Candithus Maddog, the Welsh Studies Group. I went to Dufferin House, met John Albert, asked him directly, hey, man, we're going to America. Any, any leads? Well, all he did was speak disparagingly of the Welsh in America. He didn't give me one phone number, one name. He didn't tell me that Ninai, the newspaper, existed already. I don't know why he didn't divulge. And Paul, coming to you, I think that is um, a, a, an insularity that this man carried in himself. I asked him plainly, and he didn't hand over. Well, we found ourselves we found ourselves in St. Louis, lost, looking for that famous ark, which has a fascinating museum of ethnicities. And I, it, I truly tell you, we rolled down the window of our camper van. Oh, ask this person. Missed it. Ask that person. Missed her. We must ask this person. We are lost. And I actually jumped out. Excuse me. Excuse me. And this lady was Angharad Garlic, Raymond Garlic's daughter. We just stopped her by chance on the street. Now, there's no explanation for these things. Just there's no explanation for me finding the temple as I did. But we found Angharad Garlic by chance. She took us to, oh, who's the poet? He co-wrote uh, Janus, Janus with um, Jim Park Nest. We went to his pub where he did his best to host Welsh projects in a, in a pub context. And that's where we got our first leads. In the chapel where I grew up, there was a plaque on the wall, Reverend Griffith Griffiths or something, born Kentfig Hill, died Kansas City. So we went to Kansas City in the days of microfiche, and my poor wife almost vomited at the speed we were flashing through these microfiche. Anyhow, we never did find this minister, God rest his soul. But there was an individual in Erdrich who corresponded to this Welsh newspaper, the oldest Welsh newspaper in the States. And we just turned up at his place of work. And being an academic, he was fast asleep behind a wall of books. He had quite a shock, but he put us in touch with the next contact. And by the time we got to San Francisco, we had a roll of contacts leading us deeper and deeper into this um, Welsh American historic world. And at some of the festivals, one festival in particular, I was standing next to a man and he was singing with a talent. He was an older man. I said, gosh, you can, you can really sing. You've really got it there. And he spoke to me in American, and he was a third generation Welsh speaker. There are families that keep it on the hearth. I was astonished by this. It was very special. Yeah, so. Um... Can I ask a question? Can you hear me? Yeah. Ah, Shima, it's lovely to hear from you. We can't see you. Go ahead. 
Uh, I just have one query. I posted it, but didn't get a response from you. Probably you were busy. Um, uh, I I just want to ask you: Were you were you a Buddhist monk in Japan? Thank you, Ashima. Ashima is joining us from New Delhi. We met um, when I was on a tour there. Very memorable tour. And um, so Ashima's just asked me if I was a Buddhist monk in Japan. Well, I'm sorry to say, in for a penny, in for a pound, I still am a Buddhist monk. I just don't have a shaved head. <laughs> it's not something I can uh, gouge out of myself. And I'm going back to Japan in April and May to reconnect with that experience. And I'll probably shave my head again. So, yes. Ashima. Dear Ashima. And for how long? For a year or more than that? Two years. Oh, oh, oh that's, does Zen help, David? Does it help with anxiety? Oh, I'm not sure about that, Ashima. It, um, they give you these puzzles to study called koans. What is clapping with one hand and that kind of thing? And that generates tremendous anxiety while you're meditating. But suddenly the abbot hits you with his stick and uh, you move on to the next moment. But no, meditation does help. I'm being a little bit comical there. You should know that. You live in India. Meditation does help. Thank, thank you. Um, are there any other questions? I, I've got um, another a comment to make, really. Um, you're sort of talking about, um, y yes, that, that uh, the, the Welsh don't have kilts or, or you didn't, you know, that sort of outward symbols of what, of what that identity is. But a, a, a strong theme of the Welsh societies in America is, um, is still the, uh, well, obviously the Eisteddfod tradition and the Gamanva Gani. Um, so, yeah, I wondered if you could say a bit more about Sure. That. Singing. The Welsh can sing. They used to sing more. I'm very angry at the 1960s, actually, with its cultural onslaught and, and its mockery and the disappearance of the Gamanva Gani uh, tradition in Wales. In North Carolina, I spent time following the book as a result of the book with the man who was the uh, director of education for the state, a most interesting man. He contacted me. I visited him quite a few times. He just wanted to confirm his Welsh background. And um, he said, listen, when I was a boy, we'd stand around the piano, not only at the weekend, but any day of the week. And we'd sing and we'd sing and we'd sing. That's Welsh, ain't it? So he was exploring his Welsh background and he was deeply involved in education and claimed that as part of his Welsh heritage. And he said proudly, he said, listen, I took this state through schools desegregation and we didn't lose a day's school. He was very proud of his background in education. And that connects with, you know, there's a Welsh teacher in every school in England. But singing is what we can carry, I feel. This is why this is such a great project, Rohan. But I go to a funeral these days more frequently than before. And the singing is often of really very poor quality, I'm sorry to say. Not only because the language has slipped away from those who go there, although they get it in school. But if we're not careful, this great claim that we have in Wales of being able to sing, it's in danger of fading away. That's my feeling. Um, I don't know if anybody has anything to say about that. Uh, but, so that yeah, I mean, the Welsh in America still love to sing. There's a wonderful woman named Alwyn Welk, deceased now. She wrote the Command um, Vagani hymnal and the Alwyn's maiden name is Morgan, and the Morgan family, I can't remember, I think it's Wisconsin, carried the Welsh singing tradition. They have a Kamanvagani circuit there, 
a preaching circuit and singing is how the Welsh there maintain their, um, I say identity sounds too strong, but maintain their heritage amongst themselves. It's not an identity that they blare. So uh, just to explain perhaps to those who um, don't know, a Kaman Vagani is a, a kind of a hymn singing festival um, and yeah, would very much be hymns such as Pererin Oiv um, would be sung. I was just um, aware, obviously um, tonight's session is very much about a, a, a Welsh identity, but I, I wonder if there um, are any questions um, from our Irish participants tonight or any comments. I just one thing um, from the book, David, is um, you talk about uh, how an Eisteddfod developed in Edwardsville. Um, oh, right. And it, it, it comes about because um, it's a mining place uh, and uh, Yes, the the Irish miners are having their St Patrick's Day celebration, and so the Welsh decide that they will have have an Eisteddfod on that day uh, as well. So. Yeah, that's right. Um, it's a fascinating. Well, what do we call them? I immigrants, immigrants, ethnic groups. The origin of the Welsh festival itself was in response to an Irish holiday. I think it might have been in, in Chicago, Niagara Falls. It was in Niagara Falls. The, the, that section there, Cleveland, Erie, Niagara Falls. The Irish were determined, the Irish workers were determined to have a festival on Labor Day weekend, I think, regardless. So the Welsh workers noticed, hey, the Irish are doing it. Why don't we do it as well? And similarly, in Edwardsville, which had a very strong personality at one point, and his chapel still exists. The determination that they had to hold their own events was in response to watching the Irish groups um, honour theirs, if you like. Um. And obviously, um, there's a connection. Uh, sorry, you 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 ended up in Georgia, um, which is where you 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 set up the society. And um, but Georgia is also significant from from Wexford um, as a as a place of um, emigration. In Savannah. Yeah, I don't yeah. know if there's anybody here tonight who's able to to say more about that. Um, Rachel, are you? Unfortunately, I'm just looking through the list and there were um, people connected to that um, project on the call, but they have since have to, had to leave. So um, it's been really interesting, um, I suppose, listening to David, because I think um, from the Wexford perspective, there's a lot of parallels and um, connections in terms of what you mentioned about mumming and um, I know here in Wexford, there's a mumming tr tradition and um, it would be more centered around plays. Um, and that's something that, you know, I think we, we could definitely exchange some ideas on. I just wanted to ask David um, a, a quick question in relation to language. Um, I have a huge interest in um, how people connect to language um, as, a, as a means of identity. Um, and in, in my work, I would collect um, a lot of words in the Irish language that um, would have would kind of be very much alive in the English language and people wouldn't actually realise they use them. Um, for example, the word, you know, um, someone might say that the cup broke into smithereens um, and that comes from the Irish word smithereeny. Um, did you, um, I know when you initially went out to um, Georgia, um, you didn't have the Welsh language, but in hindsight or in, in your, your work since, have there been particular words, Welsh phrases or words that you have um, heard from people whose maybe grandparents um, emigrated um, from Wales and, and they were passed on through the generations? Was there anything in particular that you remember or recall? Well, there, there are people who know a lot more about that than I do. Okay. I can only recall this one comical. Well, I, I met I met several ladies 
uh, of an age whose whose name that they were they were named uh, Mavanui. I met several Mavanuis, which is a, a wonderfully rich name in Wales, but in America it's a bit of a handful. So they became Mavi. My name's Mavi. <laughs> but I met um, Welsh people of uh, people of Welsh background in New York, for example, who still said Shumai Shudichi, which is hello, how are you? With having no idea what it meant. <laughs> so they would say Shumai Shudichi. And their friends would say, and if you do, you'll clean it up. Which is just, just a joke, you know. But they did carry these kind of historic uh, snippets. Yes. Um, how are you? Right da. But without being able to speak Welsh, like, how are you? I'm fine, thanks. These faintest vestiges mm. of Welsh. But you find that here in South Wales. Um, people will talk to their dog in Welsh, but they don't speak Welsh to each other. Yeah. Like, go kutch and stuff like that yeah. Yeah. kutch dan star so we get these vestiges in the non welsh speakers of, of south wales mm -hmm. or, or in my family experience my grandparents would speak welsh to each other but not to their son my father so my father was brought up with the, with the experience of they only speak welsh when they don't want me to understand <laughs> yeah. yeah well it's been established that this myth of visitors from outside Wales going into a pub and uh, or they were all speaking English until we stepped in and then they all switched to Welsh. It's been established that this is a complete urban myth. There's not one case of it. And I heard it repeated to me when I was in Rochester just the other week. But the poor storyteller completely messed it up because he claimed it happened in Cardiff. There's no way he's going to walk into a pub in Cardiff without speaking Welsh, English, I mean, and they switch to English. The, the, you've got what I'm getting at. They're all speaking English and they switch to Welsh the moment I walked in. This isn't true anyway. It's an urban myth and it's never going to be true in Cardiff. And there are other urban myths like this regarding, um, regarding language transmission. I've returned to Welsh. I think I've accounted for that. But my brother hasn't returned. We have a situation now where my brother's children speak Welsh and my children don't. I speak Welsh and my brother doesn't. So it's a very fragmented story in the minority language field. And I found this when I visited the Basque community in Idaho. That was fascinating. Polish speakers. The praise for my book came from people interested in ethnic languages in the United States. The criticisms of Welsh fever came from academic researchers who knew a lot more about how a book like that could be written. But mine was written as a, an honest um, kind of autobiographical narrative with some research. The whole thing could be rewritten. Um, so Caroline has her hand raised. Um, cheers. Hi, I've got um, just two uh, short things to say. Firstly, I was once on a, a residential Welsh language course and a retired civil servant lady was on it and um, <coughs> she wanted to um, you know, be able to talk in Welsh. Her grandparents had spoken Welsh. Her parents had spoken Welsh. But she'd been completely discouraged from speaking in Welsh um, because they said, you know, no, work on your English, you get a better job. And I'm delighted to say that, um, you know, when I was a lecturer at Colleague Segar, is that we were encouraging students to submit their assignments in the Welsh language. Obviously, in my own case, I would have handed it to a colleague to do the assessment because I, I don't speak Welsh. Um, but we were saying, you, know, you need to learn on your, keep your Welsh up and work on it because that will help you with jobs. You know, and it's quite, it's good that there's that sort of reversal now with the Welsh Assembly and the bilingual, bilingualism. It's great that uh, students are actually being encouraged to, to use the Welsh language. Um, 
and it's even stronger now, I know, since the years that I've left. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is, sorry, old age, it's gone straight out of my head. Anyway, that's it. Well, it's, it's still very uneven, and it's easy to forget that characters like Fred Francis had to vandalize um, civil service offices and go to jail to get uh, basic changes to the, uh, the curriculum. He actually she vandalized my office at the college. They didn't sit in. Okay. And well, who did this? Yeah, well, um, so now it's a cross curricular subject with mathematics. Mm -hmm. But I mean, just the other day, I formed the doctor's surgery and uh, press one for the Welsh option. You get to the Welsh option and what it are. I say, well, can I proceed in Welsh? Oh, no, we have to, they make us say that. And there is no well speaker at the end of the line in, in any case. So it, it's still very uneven here. A grounds for optimism. Uh, Welsh is regarded as one of the most successfully transmitted languages uh, because of the commitment. English is the most successfully transmitted. Hebrew is next and Welsh is in the top five, I think. But it's still very uneven. And of course, Welsh is a, a beautiful ancient language. And the more ancient we keep it, the better for, for some people. What a beautiful ancient language you have. But it's not an ancient language. It's um, just a way of fudging things. I do think that the only reason that the English language is so successful is because it was forced on countries all over the world over the years. It was well, a forced language. Yeah, there's a there by hand <clears throat> scale. But here in Kevin Kruber, for example, we seem to have a protective layer of non-speakers who, who are still hugely proud, envious, carrying some guilt, and they 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 they, they proudly protect the core of what Welsh speakers remain here in the village. And in the 1990s, I recorded them. And yes, my auntie Agnes <coughs> spoke this dialect, which is regarded as very attractive, actually, Gwen Hoiseg. And so I've got her on tape, God bless her. There's um, just thinking what you're saying there about an ancient language, the, 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 the um, Welsh is my second language. I, I'm a learner. And that was, and that's what um, we, we've always been called. Uh, Welsh learners but um, there's a new sort of phraseology at, at the moment is that new speakers that's right new speakers of the language now yeah, so yeah. Uh, yeah. you're a returner I might be a new speaker yeah <laughs> returners learners new speakers I think this is very helpful actually yeah um so yeah ch changing the language around language as well yeah. which I want to speak to um a comment that Ro Rosemary had put in the chat as well about um barriers to speaking the language sometimes as well mm. and um Oh, they stay, they're still there, sure. Yeah. But yeah. I really believe that the arts, and it took the Senate a long time to notice, David Ellis Thomas finally noticed that if we get the arts into the Senate, yeah. people are staying away from that building, you know, it's very attractive, stunningly attractive. But why go there? You have to go through these security barriers. It's slightly pretentious. But now they host... Um, art exhibitions of all sorts, international in my case, local in other cases. And this brings traffic into that building with its fabulous mushroom in the center. Um, there's not much else could bring people in, I think, unless it's a community project involving art. And we've got great art being made in, um, in Wales these days. Sarah Rees and everyone she knows, Ewan Bala, real uh, difficult rebel there. But the list of productive artists in Wales is impressive. Um, is there anyone else who'd like to ask a question? Uh, Seamus. Uh, just uh, just to, to make, <laughs> make an observation, you were talking earlier about um, uh, Wales and singing <clears throat> and I was talking to somebody only a week or two ago um, about 
Wales and singers in Wales and um, I, 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 as far as I'm concerned, everybody in Wales can sing. They're beautiful singers. Um, I, I've been to um, the Cardiff to the, to the rugby matches and <clears throat> um, being a singer myself, I, I, uh, I, I absolutely adore the fact that when you go to the rugby matches in Cardiff, all of the Welsh people sing in Welsh and they sing the Welsh. And, and I've been, I actually went to a match one day with six Welsh guys that I used to, to uh, work with. And uh, I, I was standing in the middle of them and they all sang with the crowd in Welsh. And I mean, it made the hair stand on the back of my neck. It was just unbelievable sure. uh, for to hear that uh, chorus. <laughs> in the stadium and, it, and it, it just um hardens the fact that as far as i'm concerned everybody in wales is a great singer you know and uh, in fact uh, just uh, you spoke earlier on that you, you mentioned the fact that you had met tom jones in some place or other but uh, um i don't know if any of any of you saw tom jones he was a, there's a program on the television which strangely enough i've only ever seen one episode of but it's called the voice <clears throat> people go in and sing and they get picked out by different artists but Tom Jones was on it and somebody asked him during the program to sing a song mm -hmm. and um, he sang his latest song um, and he, he turned around to the musical director and he said I'm not sure he said if you know the music for this song he said but he told him what it was and the guys, the guy just said to him on the spur of the moment, okay, he said, I'll, I'll, we'll go with it. And Tom Jones sang and I, I, I tell you, there was tears in my eyes just, mm. and I said to the, to the lads here, now there is the difference. Like uh, there are other uh, pop singers in the thing with him. And I just said, I, I said to the lads, look, there's the difference between a singer and what these other guys do on stage, <laughs> you know, it's yeah. just unreal. Yeah. yeah, Tom Jones's appearance on Desert Island Discs is actually very interesting. I, it's worth looking up. Really? Yeah. Yeah, very unexpected. Very amazing. He's an amazing singer. And I mean, Tom just Jones, singer, Desert Island oh, Discs. Yeah, when I, met, uh, sorry. When, I, when I met him, uh, you know, chit chat, chit chat, and then he said to me, what are you doing over here then? He has this enormous valleys natural speaking voice absolutely un unchanged very impressive person Seamus I, I think it's it's worth pointing out that in Wales everybody sings except some people aren't that good at it <laughs> well yeah I, mean, um, but, I, but, I have but to I have to say that's, that's, that's the same that's the same uh, no matter where you go it's the same in Ireland you know <clears throat> there are quite a few singers in Ireland some, uh, not some way. What, what, what I think is, is fair to say, though, is, is that Welsh language education, uh, you can see the difference between singers at school who've been through Welsh language education and, exactly. and those who've been through non-Welsh language education. And the difference is astounding. Yeah. I, I remember, um, just on that point, um, about not not everyone being uh, great singers. They could all sing, but they're not, they weren't great singers. I remember before I came to live in, in uh, London, um, we used to, in Wexford, we used to have the, the, the Wexford singers and storytellers, of which there were about, I think about 30 to 35 at a time. Once a month, we used to get a bus and we'd, drive off we pick out uh, a little pub very little known pub out in the middle of the sticks it could be up on the side of a mountain or anywhere and we'd go off there we'd let them know that we were going to be there uh, on a particular night this was once a month and we went to some very obscure places in the county but the interesting thing about it was that we met a lot of people there and i i recorded um a lot of um stuff in the past a lot of songs and that stories 
and uh, we met a lot of people there that sort of had never been any more than maybe 10 miles away from uh, that area from their homes um, and a lot of them sang songs they wouldn't have been the greatest singers and I remember saying to, to somebody that was in the crowd that they, they leaned over to me and they said god he's not a great singer I said as far as I'm concerned he's a marvelous singer because he's now singing a song of the locality that we've never heard before so I mean that man was invaluable he mightn't have been a great singer but he he did what uh, you know, we were able to make out um, the air that he had and uh, the songs that he was passing on. So we did, as I said, we did that for some years over there, uh, over in Wexford, and uh, it was very successful because uh, we, we got a lot of stuff that otherwise would have been maybe lost. When that person was gone, that song mightn't have been gone anymore, you know. It was, it was very good. But uh, we were talking earlier on there about um, Savannah. And I was reading uh, Monsignor Laurie Kill's book um, about the Wexford connection with Savannah. And uh, it was interesting that even before uh, Savannah, the city of Savannah was, was founded in 1733 by uh, General Oglethorpe, um, who was a British general. And it was interesting to note that uh, General Oglethorpe's mother was a woman called Eleanor Wall from Tipperary in, in Middle Ireland. So, um, you know, and and at that time, 1733, um, there were actually uh, Irish people uh, in Savannah, whatever it was called before then. But uh, there were Irish people there, and of course, the big the big influx then uh, came after the famine in 1847. But um, um, it the I, I think about 1850, there was 1,500 people uh, from Wexford alone registered in Savannah. And, and in 1852, two years later, uh, there were way over 3,000 uh, people from Wexford registered there. But that came about, it, it was made very easy for Wexford people because uh, James Graves, um, who was part of the Graves uh, shipping company, New Ross, uh, James Graves started up in uh, started up a business in Savannah, and he used to send. Uh, he used he, he shipped out of uh, Wexford Harbour and New Ross, and uh, because the, the 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 Wexford people in Savannah knew, obviously that he was going back and forth. They sent uh, remittances back f uh, from Savannah. People that had made a few bob. In America, and they sent back money to the people in America, and a lot of the, or sorry, the the people in Wexford, and uh, of course a lot of the people in Wexford then were able to get their tickets and go out on the next ship back to Savannah. So uh, it was made pretty handy for for that area, you know. Thank, thanks, Seamus. Um, it's good to good to hear um, a bit more of that uh, that history as well. Um, the yeah is it the graves can be um is that the, the dunbrody ship was that um that's part of that that company yeah. um sorry i'm t i'm conscious that we have reached eight o'clock um yeah. it's been quite a wide-ranging discussion um tonight um but i i must let you all go now because you've um uh, we, we yeah we've 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 um we've had our allotted time um i do have just a couple of announcements to make um uh for those of you in pembrokeshire um on the 22nd of october um there is a pilgrimage day um being uh, it's part of the ancient connections project a, a seven mile walk um i think it's from around white sands to to st david's so if any um if anybody wanted to to uh, join that event, um, uh, you can find out more details about it on the Ancient Connections website. Um, so I'm just going to flag that up. Um, but also, um, just to say thank you, Dilchon Valiauni, David, um, Noson, and Hagoil. Um, really special night. Um, I was going to attempt to say in Irish, Gore may agat. 
perhaps Rachel will help me with the, trans uh, the pronunciation there. Gurav Mila Maha Gwiv. You'd say a Gwiv because there's more than one. So Gurav Mila Maha Gwiv. Yeah. We'll, we'll both work on our Irish and Welsh. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. That's lovely. Um, and um, and just to say, um, yeah, so a, a lot of interesting things have come up tonight. Um, um, but one thing I'm conscious that we haven't talked about in relation to the America is uh, sort of the, the effect of, of people on the indigenous native population of, of that place. Um, uh, sort of using that as a way to talk about the, the next session, which will be on the 27th of October, which again is Welsh themed, but it, um, it will be with Gareth Bonello, who's a, a, a singer song writer, um, goes by the name of The Gentle Good. Um, he has done a project looking at um, a Welsh Methodist missionary activity in Meghalaya, which is uh, in northeast India. Um, uh, there's a, uh, a, a another, another Welsh hymn called Brunia Cassia, which is the hills of Cassia, uh, which is written in <laughs> reference to that place. Um, and he has been uh, visiting that place and working with musicians out there, but really sort of researching into the legacy of what that missionary activity was and how it impacted on that place and those people. So a very interesting session coming up there. So that's the 27th of October. Please um do do uh log on uh again book your space um but i will i will send everybody here tonight details about that as well um and yeah really i wanted to again say thanks david and i'm what i'd like to do is actually as we uh sort of leave the session tonight uh, david rosemary sent us a song but actually the first person who sent me a song was david who has sung pererin oiv and if, if he's OK with this, I'm, I'd like to, to play us out tonight by um, listening to David sing that song. In Romania. In Romania, exactly. Um, yeah. 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 Where, whereabouts exactly? The city of Yash in eastern Romania. So I'm just going to uh, share the screen again and get rid of that. So we will zoom out on the map. And we will find Romania. Oops, there we are. Pererere noiv mewn anial dyr Yn crwydro yma thro Ac yn rhyw ddisgwyl bob yr awr Fod tydd yn chod gerllaw Ac ni debygaf claw af sŵn Nefolaidd rai o mlaen Wedi gorffygu o mynrwy Dymhestloedd dŵr a thaw Tilled a split santaith led ya forth, be the be new a thong. Nicher thine go with honour come on a body de online. Me oir of wife ya all a bit. Ac ar y aswylo Am hynny ar wain gam a cham Fi i'r barad wys draw Mae hiraeth arnaf am y blad Lle mae torfaeth diri Yn can i'r anthem dyddiau hoes Am angau calfari Diolch yn fawr, David. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So, yeah. Um, thank you very much, everyone, and um, wish you 
all the best and um, hopefully see you in two weeks time great thank you thank you thank you thank you Salon. Salon. Yeah, well. oh. Oh.